Some of you I have known for uh, <laughs> some of you I have known for about 20 years. So, and some of you I've known for about a decade. We've been watching each other aging during this entire time. It's uh, it's a frightening thing, isn't it? Um, yeah. Uh, but not all organisms do this. Um, this is a creosote bush you, not far from 15, Interstate 15, which you take from here to uh, Las Vegas, where probably you would be engaged in activities that would shorten your lifespan. Um, this is just one of a whole bunch of plants and animals that don't undergo aging at all. Um, to evolutionary biologists, uh, the reasons for this are fairly straightforward. Um, in organisms that evolve by strictly symmetrical fissile reproduction, that's splitting exactly in two with no product of the division being specially favored or disfavored, uh, natural selection stays strong. Uh, because if it didn't, basically that lineage would go extinct. And evolution, therefore, gets rid of the problem of aging. Um, and what this tells those of us who are evolutionary biologists is that the molecular and cell biology of eukaryotic cells has nothing to do with the fundamental cause of aging whatsoever. Not telomeres, not metabolic damage, none of those things. All of those are things that evolution can readily solve. Um, so we explain aging in completely different terms. Uh, basically, um, aging is when evolution by natural selection starts to care less, like the uh, long-suffering uh, Rhett Butler vis-a-vis -vis Scarlett O'Hara. Um, and this is not a verbal formalism, of course, not a verbal, I should say, not a verbal formula. It is a mathematical result which derives from first principles. And if you have a population with a reproductive pattern like ours, you will inevitably age according to evolutionary theory. And the key equations are Hamilton's forces of natural selection, one of which I plot here, which are defined most importantly by two parameters, little b, the first age of reproduction in a population, not the first time you got lucky, and the last age of reproduction in a population, little d, the parameter that Hugh Hefner is working on as we speak. <laughs> um, before the first age of reproduction in a population, natural selection is uniformly powerful in terms of keeping you alive. After the last age of reproduction of any individual in a population, natural selection truly doesn't give a damn, Scarlett. And, uh, for a long time, we thought that meant that you would necessarily die really fast. It turns out we were wrong about that interpretation. And when, when we've done more explicit simulations of this evolutionary process, uh, which my colleague Larry Muller and I started doing in the mid-1990s, we discovered that instead what you got was the end of aging and the end of this period of deterioration. Um, for some species, particularly some insect species that have been studied, there is a, can be a very prolonged post-aging phase of life. In humans, there is a very limited uh, post-aging survival. Uh, but that is still fundamentally the reason why we have so many supercentenarians, Stephen Coles, and your beautiful data, which your group published in Re Aubrey's uh, Rejuvenation Research, are a beautiful vindication, of course, of the evolutionary theory of late life or biological immortality. But that's not my topic today. I'm just giving you that to, to frame this equation, uh, which is plotted there. So basically what this means is the timing of reproduction controls the evolution of aging. And just to be crude about it, we have an uh, animation. Um, basically, if a gene is going to kill you with certainty and it kills you before reproduction, natural selection will completely clean it out. After the last age of reproduction, if a gene will kill you with complete certainty, natural selection doesn't care, and things get ugly. Um, and in between, you have that smooth transition, uh, which uh, for us mathematically, which you, we are all experiencing as aging, because I don't think there's anyone here over 95. Um, so we're all aging. Um, as I said, uh, evolutionary theory predicts aging in all strictly non-fissile organisms and 
of course, the most important organism is the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. Um, it is a classic mortal or aging organism. Um, uh, I'm just showing you this so that some of the biology I'll be talking about will be a little bit concrete for you. Um, one of the important things, uh, pointer. Oh, Stephen Cole. Stephen Cole's pointer. Well, wow, excellent. I'm honored. Um, so anyway, multiple episodes of reproduction, distinctive juvenile phase, obvious transition to adulthood, all of which makes our experimentation easier. Um, and in 1977, I realized this following thing, which is that if I shift the age of period of reproduction, I'd be cleaning out uh, alleles with deleterious early effects and uh, produce the evolution of longer, more robust lifespan in the course of evolution of these organisms. Note, not an instantaneous effect. Evolution by natural selection in the laboratory needs to... Let's see if I can go back again. Yeah. So... <clears throat> You basically do this shift, let's see if I, and then you have to wait for evolution to do this. And the more generations you wait, the better the result you get, the longer and longer your lifespan that you expect to produce from this. Now, unlike caloric restriction and other types of manipulation, this is a, a positive prediction of a theory. And I'll just point out, this is the only theory of aging of any kind where we can easily make uh, predictions derived deductively from a formal theory and predict what experiments will do under defined conditions, which to me is the hallmark of science. Um, so this is um, historic stuff. Um, this is the second time I did an experiment of this kind. Experiments like this have now been done repeatedly by people, uh, primarily with fruit flies, also with other insects, also with mice. I'm going to show you uh, data from the second uh, version of this experiment, which I started in February 1980. It's going to hit 30 years in a few months. <clears throat> uh, the protocol is very simple because we can control when we get eggs from adults to start the next generation. Here, cell flies are normally reproduced with young adults only. The adults are then discarded after laying eggs. Uh, to journalists, I call this trailer trash reproduction. Um, here's the... Um, MD, PhD pattern reproduction, you delay actually reproducing um, until you hit a later age and only then do you reproduce. And that's effectively what I did in terms of shifting that reproductive box to later ages. And then of course you wait and wait for evolution to do its thing. Uh, this is a little bit of detail about how we do this. Um, I'll skip that for now. These are the results. Um, these are the controls. This is about halfway through the experiment. This is around 15 years ago. <coughs> controls here bred normally. These are, um, all, all these flies, by the way, were assayed under standardized conditions in parallel. Um, this is the product of about uh, 80 generations of this experiment um, with delayed breeding. And as you can see, they're living much longer in the males and also in the females. At this point, it was a little over twice the average lifespan. Uh, now we're around four times the average lifespan with this experiment. Um, and it will just, from what we can tell, go on indefinitely. <clears throat> uh, starting in the 80s and continuing through the 90s, we just studied a lot of the physiology, <clears throat> the organismal physiology of how this was achieved. <clears throat> um, one of the dramatic things um, is that the overall or total amount of reproduction in the course of these much longer lived lives, <clears throat> this total amount of reproduction is much greater. Um, dramatically better male mating success later in life, and by the way, later starts actually fairly soon. Um, better resistance to all kinds of acute stresses, uh, much greater athletic performance. There were some reductions in the physiological performance or achievements of these organisms, most notably reduced early fecundity under bad conditions, not under good conditions, and slower rates of development by about a day to a day and a half, which is fairly significant for a fruit fly, but if these were your kids, it would mean they wouldn't be misbehaving in high school or the first two years of college. Um, so, in effect, this is our claim that these organisms have a truly worthwhile enhancement of their aging profile. These are not organisms, unlike CR organisms, which have had substantially reduced performance 
by a biologically important metric. CR organisms, caloric restriction organisms, protein restricted organisms are characteristically reduced in their ability to reproduce in aggregate. Um, <clears throat> that is not true of these organisms. Um, there are a variety of substances or interventions which you can imagine pseudo-hibernating or metabolically refrigerating organisms whereby they would live longer, uh, but that is not the case with these guys. In fact, their metabolic rates are not changed uh, at each age of adulthood and their overall metabolism, their total amount of metabolic work done in their lives is greatly increased. Um, so this for us is like, this is what we would all like, right? So you'd all like to live four times longer with long-term maintenance of your functional capacities. 